Hi everybody, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby and welcome. If you've never been here before, never watched any of my videos, have no idea what I do, I cover true crime cases and all of the cases that I cover are a little bit older. They're all basically 20 years or older. So if that's something that you might be interested in, maybe go down below, click that subscribe button and also make sure to turn on the post notifications to be notified every time that I upload. So before I get into today's case, I do have to say that today's video is a collaborative piece. If you remember, I I worked with Michelle Short for my video on the Ada Herodine case. Michelle does incredible write-ups for The Crime Wire. Her work is very thorough, yet to the point, and that's really what originally captured my attention when I started reading through some of her write-ups. I asked her recently if she possibly wanted to work together for some future cases, and she was all for it, which made me so happy, and she ended up sending me over her write-up for the case that we're covering in today's video. I had actually never come across this case on my own. It's another one of those unfortunate situations where this tragedy has kind of just been lost in time. But with all of that being said, this is the unsolved murder of Mabel Foote and Louise Wolf. This long running Ohio mystery took place in Parma, then simply a township, an area roughly 10 miles south of Cleveland. It was founded in 1816 and primarily farmland. Located in Cuyahoga County, it wasn't an area familiar with violent crimes. The community of only a couple thousand at the time would change their more innocent outlook on the world though in mid-February of 1921. At approximately 8.30 in the morning on Thursday, February 17th of 1921, three students made a gruesome discovery. Edith Rittenauer, Edward Rittenauer, and Ralph Pickard were on their way to school walking along the icy covered and exceedingly muddy remote Bean Road when they stumbled across the badly beaten remains of two women. These women were beaten so intensely that they were nearly unrecognizable. The students were unaware of who they were upon first glance. They were shocked even more when they acquired the knowledge of who the women were. It was their teacher, Mabel Foote, and their principal, Louise Wolf. They ran to the school immediately to get help, and this was the start of one of Northern Ohio's most puzzling mysteries. Now we're gonna get into a little bit of a backstory when it comes to the two women at the center of this extremely heinous crime. Mabel Estelle Foote, 24, was born to parents Joel and Martha Foote on April 23rd of 1896 in Brooklyn Heights, Ohio. She was the third born of five children. There was her older sister and brother, Millie and Joel, and her younger brothers, Aaron and Kenneth. After high school, she attended Baldwin Wallace College. The year she was murdered was actually her very first year teaching at Parma High School. She lived with her parents, but would occasionally stay at her cousin's home nearby. She was kind and caring. Her main goal in life was to become a missionary and travel to India to continue her missionary work there. Louise Wolfe, 38, was born Clara Louise Wolf on October 14th of 1882 in Columbus, Ohio. The names of her biological parents are unknown due to her, along with her siblings, being put up for adoption very early on. She and her siblings were adopted by different families and separated. This unfortunate beginning to her story, though, would never deter her from achieving her goals. Louise was driven and hardworking. She was actually promoted to principal of the school after only two years of teaching, which is extremely rare and shows the kind of respect she easily obtained from others. In 1921, she was living with a friend of hers named Effie. Both Mabel and Louise were well-regarded and admired in their community. They were not two women that had any known enemies. It didn't seem like anyone had any ill will towards them at all. Why anyone would ever have wanted to fiercely attack them to the point where they took their final breath is still unknown to this day. Let's go back to the day before their murders though. On this Wednesday, both Mabel and Louise stayed later at school to clean up. This was something the both of them did on the regular to earn a little extra income on top of their normal salary. Regular school let out at 3.30 p.m., but they would stay an hour or so after. The last known sighting of them alive was from C.K. Ewing, who lived across the street from the school. 
and saw them leaving the building around 5 p.m. Mabel and Louise were really good friends and they would head home together most days. They would start walking around 5 p.m. to catch the streetcar at 5.30. That day was like any other day for them. We do know that Mabel's watch was found about 150 feet away from her body and it had stopped at 5.15 p.m., which led investigators on the case to believe that that was the time of the attack, only roughly 15 minutes after they were last spotted. When it comes to the crime scene, it was a very remote road. Jane Ann Trezillo is a true crime author and she wrote a book covering some Ohio murders and chapter two covers Mabel and Louise's murder. She stated that the road now currently West Ridgewood Drive had no houses along it and was mostly apple orchards. It was a road that not a lot of people took. The three children who found them originally thought their bodies to be two piles of clothing until they got a closer look. Louise was face down right next to the road and her pocketbook was underneath her. Mabel was a little further away from the road and she was discovered face up. Her bag was found close by and it was completely open with her belongings sprawled out on the ground. Investigators believed that possibly she was trying to get into her bag at one point during the attack. It is believed Mabel was heading to her cousin's home. Her umbrella was found nearby and it was extremely bent up. Investigators believed that she may have used this umbrella to fight back against the attacker or attackers. Due to the condition of the umbrella, the fact both Mabel and Louise's knuckles had been bruised and broken and they had found skin under one of their fingernails, it is not questioned whether they put up a fight or not. It is obvious the two of them did everything they could to survive, but were tragically overpowered. Authorities would locate a fence post nearby, and this is what is believed to be the main murder weapon. It was bloody, and there was even hair stuck to it, blonde and brunette hair. Some newspaper articles referred to the fence post, though, as a bloody club, which could have been kind of confusing to the public as to what was actually used. If this murder had been done by one person and not multiple, chances are one of them would have gotten away from the attacker, but chose not to because they did not want to leave their friend behind. Their overall cause of death was loss of blood and possibly exposure. It is believed that Louise died quickly and Mabel possibly laid there for some time, could have been hours, unable to move, just trying to hold on to any life she had left in her until she succumbed to her injuries lying in the cold. Now, yes, Mabel's bag was found on the ground with its belongings spread out near it, but nothing of value was taken from it or from either of them. They still had on their jewelry, including diamond rings. So robbery was not the motive or not believed to be the motive. Was the motive possibly sexual assault? It wasn't that either because neither of them had been sexually assaulted. Unless of course the attacker or attackers, that was their original goal was to sexually assault the two women. And then Mabel and Louise just put up so much of a fight and the person or people responsible ended up taking their lives. Investigators wanted to believe at first that this had been done by multiple people because of how severe it was, more than one man but there were only ever one set of men's footprints found anywhere around the crime scene. They believe still today that one individual committed this crime and that does further solidify the theory that Mabel and Louise did not want to leave the other behind during the attack. One of them most likely could have ran away while the perpetrator was attacking the other, but it seems like they didn't want to. Other than footprints, they also did find fingerprints on Mabel and Louise that did not match Mabel or Louise's own fingerprints. There was a vacant building about 200 feet south of where their remains were found. This building was only made use of during the summer as a real estate allotment office. Some believed that possibly the culprit was hiding out in this building when he saw the two women walk by and decided to make his attack. This, of course, could never be proven though. It's just a theory. The police chief at the time was Frank Smith and he made it known to the public that he had never witnessed, never worked on a case quite like this one. Parma Township was saddened, sickened, and terrified. They wanted to find out who did this to these two beloved members of their community. But other than justice for Mabel and Louise, they also wanted 
revenge. Like I stated before, this was farm country and over a hundred farmers gathered together and they went out with any weapons they could find and they were ready for vengeance. They wanted to find the person responsible because it was now believed to be one person and they weren't going to wait for them to be arrested, sit behind bars for a period of time and then stand trial. They were going to take it into their own hands. I have discussed this before, but back in the day, it was common for locals to create an angry mob or multiple angry mobs and go after people on their own. There have been many times in history where members of a certain community had even broken into jails, took the person suspected of the crime, usually murder, and killed them themselves. If they didn't beat the person or shoot them, often they would lynch them in the woods somewhere and let authorities pick up their bodies later. One damaging aspect that I have to mention of this though is the fact that crowds of people had been walking around the crime scene and area surrounding it, which obviously tampered with the initial investigation. Authorities had brought in cadaver dogs at the beginning, but were unable to obtain any more promising information as to who possibly committed this double murder. After so many people had been around that area on the road and in the surrounding woods, it was nearly impossible for any dogs to pick up anything in the future. The Cuyahoga County Sheriff's Office joined in on the investigation within no time, and at the time it was led by Sheriff Charles Stannard. After that, the Cleveland police also got involved. This was a huge investigation. News reports of it spread nationwide. Authorities knew that this was a tight knit community, so they asked the public for help. They asked anyone to come forward with any information that they thought could have possibly been connected to the crime. Multiple people went to authorities claiming that they had spotted strange men near Bean Road the day of the murders. The reports for this though were inconsistent. Some claimed it was two men, some claimed it was three. One even claimed that one of the men was on a motorcycle. One of Maple's students actually came forward to authorities and they stated coincidentally the day before the attack, Tuesday, they overheard Mabel telling Louise that she had an interaction with a man on her way to school that day. She did not know who this man was, but he was asking where the streetcar was located. Now, sometimes young individuals will come forward, even adults, with information to simply feel included or helpful. So authorities were unsure whether this interaction had actually occurred or not, but they chose to believe that it had. One thing that overall frightened people in the area was the fact that the person responsible could have been a local. It could have been a man walking amongst them at any time. It could have even been a man who helped in the search for the killer. They had no idea. Mabel's uncle, Charles, said that most killers do end up returning to the scene of the crime. So he actually camped out nearby to see if the killer ever made his way back to Bean Road, but it didn't seem like at least when her uncle had been watching, that the killer came back to the area. Mabel's father was actually insistent that he thought the man responsible was a homeless man. He didn't know who, but a drifter, someone possibly just passing through the area and saw a violent opportunity and took it. When it comes to the footprints though, they had to have led somewhere, where did they lead? Well, they actually led to a chicken coop a few hundred yards north of Bean Road. Inside the chicken coop, investigators did locate a pile of blood. This pile of blood had been covered with bricks and sticks, anything the person could have found nearby to cover it up. And about 20 feet away was a water pump. They believed that the killer possibly went to the chicken coop to lay low and then clean up afterwards. This, of course, though, just like every other theory in this case, could never be proven. Sometimes with cases this old, at the time, authorities didn't do the best search, but law enforcement in this case, they did a very thorough search. They went door to door to speak to people directly, obtaining fingerprints from any men in the community, looking at the shoes of local men, looking at ditches, checking any abandoned structures. They did it all. Due to there being so many farms in the area, there were hundreds of barns to check they did find something relating to the case in one of these barns. In a barn on Royalton Road, not far from Bean Road, they located one of Mabel's 
books. It was not a school book, it was a personal book of hers with the inscription in it presented to Miss Mabel Foote on Christmas 1907. This book was covered in blood and they had no clue why out of everything of Mabel and Louise's, why would someone have taken this book? Why would they have taken a book? Was it some sort of sick souvenir that they eventually decided to dispose of? This is unknown. Why take a book but not expensive jewelry? It just, it didn't make any sense. I do wanna mention though that fingerprints were also found on this book and these fingerprints did not belong to Mabel or Louise. Considering though that one of them, and I'm not sure which one, had skin under their fingernails believed to be the attackers and fingerprints left behind, if this case took place today, it possibly would have been solved in no time. Unfortunately, there was no DNA testing back then or an advanced database for fingerprints Simply, all they had was old school detective work. They started thinking that due to how intense the attack was, the killer may have done this before. They may do it again. Authorities decided to look at other similar murders of innocent women close to that area. Two cases stuck out, both out of Cleveland. The first one was Elsie Cranebring a 34-year-old woman that had been snatched on her walk home from the theater on September 27th of 1918. She was taken to a vacant lot. Her head had been crushed. There was a boot print left behind on her head, and she was ultimately strangled with one of her torn garments. Her wedding ring and watch were missing, but it seems to have been a sexually motivated crime considering she was sexually assaulted. The second was a 37-year-old woman found dead in her bedroom only a few weeks before Mabel and Louise were killed. Gretchen Brandt had been struck in the head with an instrument and also stabbed. Due to a diamond ring, brooches, and other jewelry being missing, the motive is believed to have been robbery. Just like Mabel and Louise, Elsie and Gretchen fought for their lives and under one of Elsie's fingernails, authorities located a hair that did not belong to her. The styles of the murders though were all very different. There was sexual assault believed to be the motive, robbery believed to be the motive, and then two women where neither of those aspects were present. Also, Gretchen had been murdered by an intruder in her own home. If any of these murders were connected in any way that has never been proven. Authorities believe that whoever was responsible had attacked at random, that it hadn't been someone who had their eye on Mabel and Louise. Now, were there any suspects though in this case? Yes, a few at different times. The first was a man named Fred Gedling, a man with a few newspaper articles written just about him. He actually confessed to the murders of Mabel and Louise, but after further questioning, authorities deemed him untrustworthy. From untrustworthy, he would be declared insane and eventually sent to an asylum. They would come to the conclusion that he had no actual involvement in this case at all, but he would be involved in another case when in 1923, he murdered a man in Cleveland with an ax. The next suspect was a man named Frank Musta. There was a lot about Frank that made him look suspicious. For one, after the murders, he was seen covered in scratches on his face, hands, and neck all over. He also only lived about two miles from the crime scene. He was taken into custody, and when he was asked about the scratches all over his body, he told them that he got them from falling out of a tree, which I find this story personally a tad distrustful, but authorities did after detailed questioning, let him go and crossed him off the suspect list. There was also another person of interest discussed in newspaper articles, but this person was simply referred to as a local youth. Their name was never released to the public and after questioning, they were also let go. The last suspect is one that definitely stands out to most and it is one that is most discussed when talking about this case. That is Arthur Illenfeld. In April of 1921, two months after the murders, police received a letter from Arthur, and in this letter, he claimed to know 
who killed Mabel and Louise. Authorities obviously brought him in for questioning immediately. And during this questioning, he told them that he was the one who took their lives. He told officials that on the evening of February 16th, he was walking along Bean Road alone when he crossed paths with the two women. He said that he decided to expose himself to them. That at that point, Louise became disgusted, rightfully so, and called him a nasty thing. That this enraged him beyond belief. He said that he decided to grab a large branch nearby and attacked her with it. He said that when he was doing this, that Mabel struck him with her umbrella. He said that he beat Louise to the point where she was nearly dead and then turned his attention to Mabel who had been trying to help her friend and that he then did the same to her. That after that, he left the scene never to return. Authorities at first believed he may have been telling the truth that they possibly finally had their guy. They learned that he had been seen around Bean Road prior. He was a known peeping Tom and his fingerprints did look similar to those found on their lifeless bodies and Mabel's book found in the barn later on. Authorities were told that some of his family members had even helped him burn some of his bloody clothing, but upon speaking to family members, they all denied this claim. But things started falling apart quickly when it came to his story. For one, he said he used a branch. When authorities knew a fence post had been at least heavily involved in the crime in some way, even if other instruments had also been used. There was blood and hair all over the fence post left at the scene. It had definitely been used in some way. They also learned that Arthur had an immense fascination with crime stories and not just like us where we listen to true crime cases. He was obsessed. Authorities got to the point where they were considering that this man had just been heavily reading up about the case because he wasn't giving them any more information that they didn't already know. And also he was getting some of the information incorrect. Arthur was given a mental health evaluation and the psychiatrist declared him criminally insane. He was sent to Lima State Hospital. Mental health experts there would question him numerous times and conduct further mental examinations. And they would come to the overall conclusion that he had the mind of a child, a very small child. Due to them believing he was underdeveloped mentally, they did not believe he could have gone through with committing such a monstrous act as brutally beating two women to death. He was then ruled out as a suspect. There would not be many updates in this case for years. A lead came in in 1930 that they deemed promising, but again, like all of the others, it went nowhere. A $10,000 reward was posted very soon after the tragedy. This is roughly 174,000 today. This reward has never been collected. This case, 103 years later, remains unsolved. That does not mean though that people don't care. Cleveland 19 just covered this case in a segment in 2022. Multiple podcasts have discussed it, write-ups have been done, and the case is still considered open. Although it's not being actively investigated, it's, it's still open. Mabel was buried in her private family cemetery, and from my research, Louise was buried in Brooklyn Heights Cemetery, but her actual grave spot is unknown. There is though a memorial for Mabel and Louise located at 4100 West 25th Street in Cleveland, Ohio, also known as Foot Park. You may be wondering with advancements in technology if this case all these years later can be solved. I mean, yes, the person who was responsible is long gone, but could it be solved? Even the current Parma police lieutenant agrees if this crime happened today, it would be. But at some point in time, the Parma police department destroyed all case files and evidence they had for this case. It's all gone. This will most likely shock you because it shocked me. The earliest records they have on this case at the department are from 1985 roughly 64 years after the murders occurred. Like I said at the very beginning of the video, they had skin particles that they found under one of their fingernails. This is DNA. 
Today, they could have gone through with some method like genetic genealogy and narrowed down the family tree to find out who was possibly responsible for taking their lives. I understand wholeheartedly the mindset of people at a different point in history. They didn't know that something like DNA testing was going to come about, but it is so, at the end of the day, disheartening to me that all evidence in this case is gone forever. They cannot get it back. Without that DNA, the chances of this case being solved, it's basically slim to none. And it's not truly a pessimistic outlook. It's the reality of the situation. And it, it is heartbreaking. No justice would never be rightfully served in this case, but being able to solve a case that is over a hundred years old with a method of genetic genealogy would have been monumental. It is of course heartwarming though that there is a memorial set up for them because I've talked to quite a few families where they wish at least just a memorial would be set up in some way and a lot of times cities are not for that. A city may feel like putting up a monument for something that is of course, so devastating is almost leaving behind a negative footprint or solidifying some sort of bad energy there when all it is is just showing that a community still cares. But thank you all for taking a little bit of time out of your day to learn about Mabel and Louise's case. And of course, a huge thank you again to Michelle Short for her write-up done on this one. If there are any other cases that you possibly want me to cover here on my channel, make sure to send those requests over to gabulosiscaserequests at gmail.com. And before I end this video, I do wanna say that over on my Patreon, I'm trying to stay pretty active. And if you don't already know, I recently started a series where I'm going through every single year on my channel and kind of just talking about some of the videos, the cases that have really stuck with me. My first video was how I got started on my YouTube. My second video was going over some of the videos in 2017. And now my next video is 2018. And that's where I really started doing true crime content full time. So if that is something that you're possibly interested in, you can go to patreon.com slash gabulosis. I hope you all have an amazing rest of your day. Of course, stay safe like always, and I will see you in the next one.